I prepared a talk. Um, I was just praying and and uh, trying to find out what I should speak about, <clears throat> and um, uh, I thought I should speak on forgiveness, but I thought, nah. Now I wrote a talk on forgiveness, uh, threw it away. Then we get the prophetic word. It's about forgiveness. So. I want to um, – I'm, I'm going to change a little bit what I'll say, but forgiveness is, is really, really very, 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 very important um, if we're talking about receiving healing. Um, I want to talk about power too. I guess, um, how many of you would have flown into Sydney at night and you, yeah, you look out and you see all those lights? Now, with all those lights there, um, I mean, there's a lot of power happening to make those lights light up. And when you think of not only just Sydney, but you think of all the cities in the world at night there is a lot of power being generated for all that lighting. Where does it all come from? Oh, let's come back to Sydney. Where's all the power for the lighting at night come from in Sydney? A power station. Okay. There has to be a source. When you see power displayed... It points to something. It says there has to be a source for that power. Now, I know that um, years ago I was, um, it, in my former life, I was a greenie. I was on the Franklin River. Um, I was there uh, campaigning for, that. well, I was actually there making a film with some other guys um, we, we didn't want the Franklin River in Tasmania to be to be dammed. It was called the Last Wild River. That was the name of the film. We spent a, a lot of time going down the river, and of course, going down the river, we were talking about power, because the whole idea of um, damming the river was to produce power. And if you've read lately, um, New Zealand's run out of water. Um, it's their dam, their dam levels are down to uh, the lowest ever. And um, so, anyway, we were going down the river. When you're when you're in the wilderness, when you're in a place where there's there is no artificial lighting and all you have is stars at night. You, you're very aware of God. You, you just can't help it. You just have to think, where does all that come from? And it's so big. It's so awesome. And I remember sitting around a campfire and... Uh, I remember the, the guy that we were making the film with and about, who he was, um, um, he's a, a famous Australian conservationist. And I remember we were sort of, he, he was a wonderful man. And uh, we, we learned a lot from him. And he was a bit of a, an expert when it came to conservation. And... Uh, we were talking about power and and the need for this, or the, the there was no need in, in in his opinion there was no need for extra power in Tasmania, certainly not coming from uh, damming up rivers. And as as we were round the campfire, he was sort of reflecting on the greatest power, you know. Um, 
the greatest source of power on earth. And I'm thinking, wow, I wonder where he's going with this. He said, the sun. I thought, oh, okay, the sun. And I guess most of us, having been to high school, um, we know that all power, or most powers, one way or other, comes from the sun. Um, I looked it up to make sure. Uh, it's a while since I was at school, but it says, we consume energy in dozens of forms, yet virtually all the energy we use originates in the power of the atom. Nuclear reactions energize stars, including our sun. The energy we capture for use on Earth comes largely from the sun or from nuclear forces local to our own planet. Sunlight is by far the predominant source and it contains a surprisingly large amount of energy. On average, even after passing through hundreds of kilometres of air on a clear day, solar radiation reaches Earth with more than enough energy in a single square metre. So how's a single square metre? To, power, to illuminate five 60-watt light bulbs. If all the electricity could be, or if all the sunlight could be captured and converted to electricity. The sun's energy warms the planet's surface, powering titanic transfers of heat and pressure in weather patterns and ocean currents. The resulting air currents drive wind turbines. Solar energy also evaporates water that falls as rain and builds up behind dams, where its motion is used to generate electricity via hydropower. And it goes on. Photosynthesis. When sunlight strikes a plant, some of the energy is trapped through photosynthesis and is stored in chemical bonds as the plant grows. We can recover that energy months or years later by burning wood, and it can be, you know, that's how coal and oil is formed. So the sun is the source of all power. Now, I have here a picture of the sun, which I think it's worth demonstrating. This is the sun, okay? This is the source of all power. And the sun is the real source of all power. When we look at Jesus on the cross crucified, where does the power come from? Why is this a sign of victory? It looks like, a, it looks like someone defeated. Why is this a sign of victory. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Paul, the apostle, said, the message of the cross is a complete absurdity to those who are headed for ruin. But for those experiencing salvation... It is the power of God. Imagine if Jesus said, Father, don't forgive them. Look what they've done to me. There would be no power. If Jesus did not forgive on the cross. If he said, I can't do it, I'm not interested, 
It's too painful. I don't give a damn. They can go to hell. We would. The power of the cross, the power of the blood of Jesus, is in the fact that he chose to forgive. Now, if we look at Jesus, do you think that he felt like forgiving? Is it a comfortable position? Do you think he was justified in saying, nope, it's too hard, I can't do it? Of course he was. I'm justified in saying, I can't forgive, it's too hard. It's too painful. I don't want to go there. And what's more, that other person does not deserve to be forgiven. Jesus could say all of that. He didn't feel like forgiving. And yet, if he hadn't, there would be no forgiveness anywhere in this world. Nothing effective. There would be no power. It's very hard to forgive. And... Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's so hard for us to forgive that we just avoid it or we think we can't do it. But the, the, the reason Jesus died this sort of death was to say to us, that forgiveness is not about feeling. Forgiveness is about choosing. Forgiveness is not about whether someone else deserves to be forgiven or not. It's given. It's a gift. It's undeserved. No one deserves forgiveness. I don't. You don't. How can we deserve to be forgiven? It doesn't make sense. We deserve a penalty. We don't deserve to be freed. As I was preparing this... Uh, today, there was just, there was someone, this, this just kept coming to mind, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak it out now. I, f- I thought that there could be someone here today who has a problem with, um, it, it's an eating disorder. Now, I don't know, eating disorders can take various forms. Sometimes it's eating too much, sometimes it's not eating enough. I don't know what sort of eating disorder it was, but I, I felt that if that person is here, I felt that that person was, the issue for them was that it was forgiveness. But it wasn't forgiveness of someone else, it was forgiveness of yourself. And I felt that that, um, the Lord wants you to know that he's waiting for you to forgive yourself. 
He's waiting to be gracious to you. And he wants to set you free from that. Now, that just kept coming to me and coming to me and coming to me. And I thought, okay, maybe that's a word from the Lord. I'll share it. But it also made me think, how often is the most difficult person to forgive myself? The older I get, the more familiar, the, the, the more I am familiar with regret. There are things that I wish I hadn't done. There are, I'd like to rewind the tape, play it again, and get it right. I can see people nodding, and it's the older ones. <laughs> All right? Regret, regret is something, it's really hard to get past. But basically, it's that we can't forgive what we've done. But you don't have to be old to have regret. You can be young and there are things that you can regret. It's hard to forgive. The good news is that Jesus came to free us from regret. He came to free us from guilt. He came to free us from diseases, from demonic power. Now, it's, it's, it's Richie's 50th. Right, jubilee, it's wonderful. This is a jubilee year, by the way, and in the Catholic tradition, it's a jubilee year. I heard somebody speaking the other day uh, from a, a Pentecostal tradition, and he crunched all the numbers, and he was saying that this was a jubilee year. I went on the internet, and I saw that it could have been last year, could be this year, could be next year. But a lot of people have been crunching the numbers. It's fairly close. What's the Jubilee year about? Forgiveness. Okay. Now, who wants to be forgiven? Right. And that's the wonderful thing about the Jubilee year. We, or, or, or the Jubilee, any Jubilee, it's, it was about setting debtors free, setting slaves free. And, and that was meant to be something that was, that it was, it was in, in, in Deuteronomy, it was prescribed for Israel. They were every 50 years, they were meant to return, cancel all debts. Wow. Now, the best thing about being forgiven is what? You're free. You just feel free. It's just... I often think of Peter you know, and the apostles. I think of Peter, and Peter has denied Jesus three times. He's, t he's just finished telling Jesus only hours before, I'll never deny. I'll, I'll, I'm with you to the end, Jesus. I'm with you to the end. I'm, I'm in this. Come hell or high water, I'm with you. And then denies him three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. And then at Pentecost, or when, when, when Peter hears that, Jesus is risen. What's going through his heart? What's going through his mind? I've denied him. Is he really alive? What's that mean for me? How wonderful it must have been 
when Jesus reinstated him. But if you think of all the apostles apart from John, they all denied him. They all ran. And yet, Jesus reinstates them all. He doesn't condemn them. He holds nothing against them. In fact, he continues on with the plan that he set in motion before they deserted him. It's mercy. It's forgiveness. It's, it's wonderful. Jesus' mission statement... In Luke 4, Jesus stands up in the synagogue and he proclaims what he's about. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, release to prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, a jubilee, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit or a spirit of heaviness. It's interesting when we look at that, this is Jesus, um, he's proclaiming his mission statement. In that mission statement, So much of it is about freedom. Binding up the brokenhearted, liberty to captives, release to the prisoners. In fact, one fifth of the gospels, if we look at if if we took, if we removed one fifth of the gospels, we would be removing everything that Jesus did in regard to healing. Healing, deliverance, it takes up one-fifth of the Gospels. It's a significant part of Jesus' ministry. It still is. And that's why we're here. It's about forgiveness of sins. But he's also interested in our bodies. He's interested in setting us free from demonic power, And he's interested in setting us free psychologically. We have a a thing here called um, uh, healing rooms. And I've just got a list here of some of the some of the people that have come back to us and said. This is what happened to me. I'll just read a few of them. This is over the last few months. One client wrote, a woman wrote to us to thank us and to inform us that for the first time in two or three years, she had not had a bout of cystitis for eight weeks. That's um, an inflammation of uh, the bladder. Whereas prior to that, she had had it continuously. Another woman with diabetes who visited healing room several times, was much improved, and this was confirmed by medical tests and her doctor the day before she came in for prayer. Uh, another person. After prayer for a fractured right wrist, a woman felt less pain and more movement. Carpal tunnel syndrome on her right lift, uh, left, sorry, her left wrist was healed instantly and she was able to put weight on it. She had not been able to do so for 15 years. A woman felt release, relaxation and greater freedom of movement after prayer for bulging discs in the lower back. A broken neck followed by a replacement of the third vertebrae years earlier affected the way she walked, which initiated the problem. There were two cases of of debilitating neck pain and stiffness, completely healed. A man with a severe form of arthritis with uh, uh, pain in his back, neck and knees was surprised at the sudden improvement after prayer. He was able to get up straight without difficulty 
and swivel around without pain. Another man experienced improvement from gout in both feet and reduction in pain in his right knee. He also left feeling more freedom of movement in his back and knees. Another lady came in for, fi for fibromyalgia, back and leg pain, sciatica, and received full healing. She was also able to forgive her husband on a deeper level. Now, they're just things that have been happening here quietly. It's part of the Jubilee. Now, one of those, I, I happen to be in healing rooms from time to time. One lady came in a few weeks ago and she said, I've just come. She said, I don't want prayer. She just thought, I'm just so happy. I just wanted to tell you what happened. She's, she had been prayed with. She'd had um, two vertebrae. She'd broken her neck 14 years previously. She'd had two vertebrae removed from her neck and she'd had um, replacement vertebrae. The, the bone was just smashed, crushed. It had to be taken out. She had replacement vertebrae put in. And as a result of that, she'd had um, pain in her body, and especially in her back, for 14 years. She was going to the doctor every three months. She'd done that. She'd gone to the doctor every three months and it was always the same she'd always see the doctor and he'd always give her pain killers and there was never any change she had come to healing rooms and she was prayed for and as she was prayed for she said she forgave she forgave someone very close to her and she said and it was because she, she said, I chose to forgive. She said, I, I never understood that forgiveness was a choice. And uh, she told me what it's about, and it was horrendous. And she said, but when I chose to forgive, she said, all the pain went. And she said, I was very excited at the time, and, and, and I said... You know, I feel better, I feel better. But she said, I was very nervous because she said, I was, I wanted to make sure. She said, I went to my doctor and the doctor, um, she said, I went for the usual three-monthly checkup. The doctor said to me, what have you been doing? Because everything seems to be quite different. And she said, I've been going and I've been receiving prayer. And she said, I forgave this person. And she was in tears as she was, as she was laughing. And, well, she was happy and she was sad. I don't know, some people cry when, they, when they're happy, you know. Doesn't, uh, she was happy and, 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 and weeping at the same time. And she's, she was telling the doctor and she said she's, she just can't stop telling people about how good Jesus has been to her. But she still has enormous problems in her life. She is one of the most gracious and, and, and thankful people I've ever met. She was just so thankful. But she had learnt the power of forgiveness. And healing had come. One of the difficulties about receiving or forgiving is sometimes we're not aware of it. Sometimes we're not... A, aware of what we have to forgive. We can actually have resentment towards someone and not really, really know. And I remember, I can speak for myself, I, I was in a, um, in a conference some years ago and it was a John Wimber conference and I was sitting there and it was really nice just to be receiving, soaking up the worship a wonderful worship team. I'm sitting there, so count worship, and uh, and they were praying for, um, you know, that they said it's forgiveness that this area. And as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, well, thank goodness I don't have to deal with anything there. You know, I'll just sit back and enjoy the worship. And. I, I just, I really did. I th and uh, it was Andy Park was leading the worship. One of the, he was one of the, that stage, I thought he was one of the world's best worship leaders and just really enjoying it. And I, as I'm just sort of drifting off and 
there's just this scene sort of came across my mind, you know. <laughs> and um, I, I was actually, oh, <laughs> it, it surprised me because I actually had my knees on this person's chest and was banging their head on the ground saying, you've done this to me all my life. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hmm, <laughs> what does that mean? God had to show me that I actually, I had to look at that and I thought, yeah, that's my unforgiveness towards this particular person. I began forgiving this person at that point um, and I didn't tell anybody but it, it was my wife. Uh, somebody said that, Somebody said that the other day, uh, wives are like the Holy Spirit. They, they speak and it's... Anyway, she, they, they speak to you about certain things and you sort of think, I think that was God. <laughs> and anyway, I hadn't, I hadn't mentioned it. I was too ashamed to mention this to anyone. I was too, too ashamed to mention that, that I'd, I had this unforgiveness, you know. And it's, it was... And... Um, but it was my wife who said to me, um, you know, at the, this, this particular person and we'd had some interaction, she said, you know, in all the years I've known you, she said, I don't think I've ever seen you talk so much to that particular person. And, you know, you just really got on. And I thought, yeah, I think you're right. I thought, I think I've forgiven them. And it was just a wonderful thing. But I, I suppose the point was that it was Revelation 1 that... And I, I, I forgave that person for years. I chose daily to forgive that person for many years. First, it was Revelation that I needed to forgive. Secondly, it was Revelation that I had forgiven. And it was somebody else who noticed. 